turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 as we continue our journey through the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the title of this message is The Sensitive Subject of Giving. Yes, it's that time of the year. Just kidding. We only bring up giving when it comes up in our text. So if you're new here, I'm sorry, but this is uh, where we're at in our journey through the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And let's read the first seven verses and then we'll get into our message. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches in Macedonia, that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, their deep poverty abounding in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, that they freely willing, imploring with us with much urgency that they would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they gave themselves to the Lord and then us by the will of God. And so we urged Titus that he had begun so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Let's pray. Father, as we go through this amazing chapter that you would speak to us, that you would minister to us, that we would uh, sense your heart through it all, and that we would be uh, open-hearted and open-handed uh, when it comes to this uh, difficult, challenging, convicting subject of giving. And so may your will be done in our lives. May we be doers of your word, not just hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a few topics in the church more sensitive than that of giving. Uh, any mention of money uh, is sure to be perceived by some as unpleasant or intrusive. It's difficult. Uh, and uh, a lot of people come from uh, churches where this is all they talk about. And, 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 and they hound people. Um, in the 18 years that I've been the pastor here, uh, there's only been a handful of times that we've addressed the subject of giving when it comes up in our text. But then there's a couple of occasions that we've had to ask the congregation for certain things. One of them was, you're sitting on them. Before we moved into this place, we needed 50 chairs. And uh, we didn't have uh, the chairs at the time because the place where we're at the, here, they didn't have anything of offered to us. And um, so we needed uh, 50 chairs. They were $10 a chair at Bunnings. Uh, the offerings at that time were very minimal. Uh, at that time, we might have had 2,000 total coming in for the month. Uh, so this was just barely starting out for us. And uh, so we mentioned to the congregation, we need 50 chairs as we move in here. We took a step of faith where you know we're gonna, supposed to be here. And so, um, so within uh, a week or so, a couple of people, uh, they contributed to it. And I don't know who they are. I don't know who gives. It's none of my business. It's between you and the Lord. And uh, but praise the Lord for those couple of people that gave, you know, and of course, we've added to those chairs since then. Um, but it's that faithfulness and that little thing that uh, people were giving. And, um, you know, and, and even just the, the any time anyone's been with us. Uh, you know we don't pound on money. There's only one other time I think we've asked the congregation is when we were uh, uh, applying for our visa uh, to renew it, our religious workers visa. And uh, we need some extra finances to help cover those costs. So the, the proof was if you wanted us to continue as your pastor, then we would need the, the cost to help with this visa. So, um, and we're here. <laughs> so... But, um, but we just have a simple, you know, there's a box in the back for your tithes and offerings or you can give online. And that's it. That's all we talk about when it comes to, to giving and, and money. Very simple, very refreshing, what I, le I believe and what many people believe as well. Now, the subject of giving and money is certainly one of the things that driven people away from church. Uh, I find it kind of difficult as I watch a lot of churches online and this is all they're doing and preaching on. 
uh, especially those word of faith movement types of, not that I watch that stuff, but you've seen this stuff before. Uh, but churches are always pumping their, their people for money. They even have thermometers in their churches. You know how short they are. Uh, some run pledges uh, each year, or here's a vision weekend, and uh, how much are you going to pledge you know, for this year? Uh, and it's sad that many ministries and, and ministers have given Christ and his church a bad name because of their overemphasis on money. And that's kind of where it's always difficult for churches and non-believers to come into churches. Okay, here comes the money thing. You know, it's very uh, difficult. Uh, but we also have to be very careful not to go far overboard the other way, beginning to, you know, even to think that it's unspiritual to talk about money. But Jesus talked more about money than any other subject. Uh, of his 29 parables, 16 are about money and possessions. So it's obviously a big thing because that's what possesses us. And, um, and so we need to have a proper understanding that we are stewards. Uh, and it's about stewardship of what God's blessed us with. And it's his anyway, so we're giving back to him. And the Bible teaches that our giving should be an overflow of God's grace in our lives. And so Paul gives us the example of grace giving. We've talked about grace before. There's saving grace, there's sustaining grace, you know, you know, there's a lot of different aspects, but there's also grace giving. So the next two chapters, chapter 8 and chapter 9, just to prepare you, uh, is about this offering that Paul was going to talk about to give to the church in uh, Jerusalem. The Corinthian church had agreed uh, to share in the collection, uh, but had been inconsistent in doing so. And so Paul's going to remind them of the promise and at the same time explain uh, principles in giving. And we see several of those principles within this chapter. First of all, we're going to notice in the first seven, ver seven verses, it's about surrendering. Surrendering your life to the Lord is the starting place. You can't give your resources until you first give yourself to the Lord. So when you belong to the Lord, you look for opportunities to give instead of excuses not to give. Secondly, it's about motivation. Uh, it's motivated by grace. And we see the best example by Jesus Christ and, and his giving. We see also in verses 10 through uh, 15, it requires faith. Uh, so Paul encouraging them, you're stepping out in faith. It takes faith to give. The, a, a, a heart that's willingness uh, that exists, um, you know, that you're going to want to give. And, and the, the amount is secondary when it comes down to it. It's just the, the principle of faith and trusting the Lord. And then faithfulness. Uh, it requires faithfulness. So faithfulness in two ways. One, the consistency, faithfulness. But it's also, as we'll see at the end of this chapter, the faithfulness of the individuals collecting the money, the administration of it, as we see the character of Paul, of Titus, and the others that were handling the finances to bring back to uh, Jerusalem. So you needed trustworthy men, faithful men, uh, godly men uh, to do that. And it's been said how a person views money is an, an, an effective barometer of their spirituality. Uh, so if you're spiritually mature, talking about finances is not a big deal because it's the Lord's, you know. Uh, so not just saying it, but you believe it as well. And the Lord's given us three ways in how we can invest into eternity. Uh, and this is all about priorities for us. One is our time. Uh, we all have the same amount of time, but what are you doing with your time? Uh, is it all about you or is it about serving the Lord? It's, it's about having a proper balance in our life. Um, and so even if it's about you, for example, if you're out doing your thing, the Lord's going to use you uh, an opportunity to share the gospel. You know, that's using the Lord's time uh, as well and using your time wi wisely. Uh, we also see our talents, our gifts and abilities. The Lord's given each one of us the certain talents and abilities that we should use to invest in spiritual things. Um, and so that's an important thing that uh, we need to keep in mind. And then, of course, treasure. Uh, this is how we're to uh, you know, invest in the kingdom of God, but it's also you're investing in others by your investment in the Lord. And as Jesus says in uh, Matthew 6 and also Luke 12, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Now, as a bit of a background, uh, the Apostle Paul, on his missionary journeys, uh, it was accustomed to collecting an offering for the saints uh, in Jerusalem. So we're talking about, we're about 20 years from uh, the start of the church. 
A lot's happened in these 20 years in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, during those two decades, the Jewish believers uh, in Jesus had increasingly been ostracized. They had been persecuted. They had been arrested. They'd been tried, shunned. They'd been boycotted, exiled, executed uh, by their own countrymen, by their own family members, uh, and friends had turned against them. So this is all within that period of time. So now you can start to understand the struggles and the trouble that's happening in the church in Jerusalem. And the prophecy that Jesus uttered prior to his death and resurrection was coming to pass before their very eyes, as he mentions in Matthew chapter uh, 10, uh, that people are going to turn against you. Uh, your family members are going to hate you, etc. So the church in Jerusalem was hurting, and it broke Paul's heart uh, to think that the church where it all began is now possibly facing an end. And at that point, the Lord gave him kind of the seed thought. As you travel through these areas, take up a collection for the needs of the church in Jerusalem. And so Paul mentions this collection for the saints in Jerusalem in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where he provided some general instructions on how the collection uh, should be uh, managed. So it's not just the, the normal handling of the finances in the church, but also specifically so that the needs in Jerusalem can be met as well. Now, here in chapter 8, Paul returns to the issue um, as this time for his arrival is coming near. And given the difficult bumps of the road that uh, we've seen, how they were attacking him, criticizing him, and there's, there's these problems that was happening in the church against Paul, um, he understandably felt concerned about whether they would be willing to fulfill their financial commitment to uh, the church there in Jerusalem and before the Lord. And he sensed their enthusiasm uh, for the project had begun to diminish over time. They were excited at first. Hey, yeah, we'd love to give to that. But over time, it's diminished. And, and as we'll see, it's been over a year since that time. And having been kind of cut off from the uh, apostles and temporarily severed from other Christian churches because of their internal strife that was happening, uh, these false teachers and apostles that crept in there, the attention had been drawn inward to, to kind of sort the stuff out. And as a result, they lost their outward focus. And that's the problem. You know, a lot of churches, they're only inward focused. But you got to have inward focus to be about discipleship, but it's also about reaching the lost. Uh, and so we need to make sure you have that proper balance there. And to help them renew their faithfulness and encourage their outward vision, Paul sets before them uh, two examples of self-sacrificial giving. One is the Macedonians, as we'll see, and then secondly of Jesus Christ. So between these two examples, Jesus, uh, Paul sandwiches these exhortation to this Corinthians. And so during his stay in Corinth, he noticed the people were slow to give, and he shares with them why they should give. And it's sad that many Christians see that giving is more of an obligation than a priceless privilege uh, um, that we should be doing. We're reminded it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, Paul uses the church in Macedonia as an example of a giving church. Uh, and the concept of giving is grace, based upon grace. And he uses grace for giving more than any other uh, words in his letters. Uh, and, and as we mentioned, there's a lot of different ways in how grace is used. But in this context, it's about giving. And he used this collection as an opportunity to instruct them and us about grace giving. And as you come to appreciate the grace of God in your life, giving becomes a privilege uh, which expresses the gratitude of the heart uh, for what God has done and is doing for you. You can't help but want to give to the Lord. No limit can be put on it. No tithing or tipping, as Paul says in verse 5, it's giving of yourself is the point here. Uh, not a tenth of yourself, not a fifteenth of yourself. Give all of yourself, all of your resources in response to the grace of God in your life that's described here in these verses. So how do you give yourself and your resources? Well, these verses, as we said, gives us a guideline. Uh, first of all, it begins with surrendering, surrendering your life to the Lord. And by the way, grace giving is independent of your circumstances. Uh, notice verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounding in the riches of their liberality. 
What an amazing sentence that is. Notice the great trial of affliction, uh, the abundance of joy, and deep poverty. Notice those words there. Joy is sandwiched between affliction and deep poverty, and the result was liberality. So that says a lot about these churches in Macedonia. Paul had just gotten done writing uh, about his great confidence in the Corinthians, as we saw at the end of chapter 7. And now he's holding the churches in Macedonia as an example. They've experienced the grace of God bestowed upon them. And it's as if Paul would say to them, now speaking of confidence, uh, you need to know about the churches in Macedonia. The churches in Macedonia, by the way, is uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Those are the three main ones there. I'm sure that there's some other ones, but those are the ones that we see in Scripture. And the cities in Macedonia were in deep poverty. Deep poverty, uh, dirt poor is a better way of understanding that. Uh, Because the government of the land was taking the wealth and and ripping the people off. So they didn't have much. Plus a lot of other things that were going on, as we'll explain in a moment. They're experiencing a great trial of affliction. And yet, right in the middle of that, there was, by the grace of God, a joy that was among them. uh, They they gave with uh, liberality. Liberality, sincerity, generously. Uh, So even the situation where people in the midst of this affliction, there was joy in giving. It wasn't a burden for them. And it's just a miracle because the grace uh, gave, uh, overcame the instinct to hold tightly the resources that would soothe the sting out of poverty. Uh, Grace overcame the survival instinct. Instead of, no, we we can't, we can't give. We're going to keep it to ourselves. But they were by the grace of God, no, we're going to give. And, and, and they're going to experience the blessing of God even more because they gave. Uh, and that's a principle uh, within giving. Uh, can't explain it, but it happens. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, what's astonishing about their contributions that Paul tells us, they gave generously while under difficult circumstances. Now, if you recall in the book of Acts, that does Paul and his team were treated very harshly, both in Philippi and Thessalonica. Uh, Paul and Silas were beaten uh, in prison in Philippi. Why? Because they were casting a, a demon out of a slave girl. And they were taking money off the slave girl, so she was profitable, and she got delivered. And so they uh, threw uh, Paul and in, in, uh, Silas in jail. Uh, The unbelieving Jews in uh, Thessalonica stormed the house of Jason where Paul was staying and dragged Jason before the government officials and charging him with treason. So Paul had to flee Thessalonica. He was only there for a couple weeks. And what you saw, what he taught there in 1 Thessalonians is an amazing book of what he taught the Thessalonians during that time there. But he, he had to flee so he wouldn't be killed by the mobs. Well, the the saints at both Thessalonica and Philippi were still experiencing these intense persecution from unbelieving Jews and Gentiles. Part of the persecution included the loss of work as the Christians in those cities were denied work because of the union, because of the the trade guilds. Uh, You're a Christian? Oh, no work for you. And that's how they did it then. No work for you, no vaccination, right, is how that happened recently. (laughs) But the fact that the economic condition uh, of these churches was so bad that Paul describes their condition as deep poverty, uh, which means, like we said, rock bottom, uh, destitute. Yet in spite of these difficult economic circumstances, these saints gave generously and sacrificially to their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Why? Well, Paul writes there in verse 2, having experienced the grace of God and the abundant joy that brings that they couldn't help but give to the work. Uh, what the Lord uh, had done for them. They gave despite their circumstances because the grace of God bestowed upon them. So the formula they used was something like this. Great affliction, deep poverty, plus grace equals abundant joy and abundant liberality. That's how it works. When you have that mentality, it's the Lord's, and he's going to put that joy in you. It's not a burden to give, it's a joy to give. And so Paul reminds them that grace motivates us to to give despite our difficult circumstances. Whatever difficult circumstances that you may find yourself in, it's the Lord's. I'm going to give, and he'll put on your heart what you're to do. 
Verse 3 continues and says, For I bear witness according to their ability. Yes, what? Beyond their ability, they were freely willing, employing us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship ministering to the saints. So even though these churches were going through tough times, they shared generously. I'm reminded of what uh, the account in Matthew chapter, no, no, um, Mark chapter 12, uh, where uh, Jesus is sitting in the courtyard of the temple, and he saw a widow drop her two mites into the offering, equivalent to kind of an um, eighth of a cent uh, into the offering. Because Jesus was watching how the people gave rather than what they gave, uh, he singled out this woman and says she gave the most. It was how she gave, not what she gave. And, and like this widow, the church in Philippi gave out of their poverty. And when you experience the grace of God in your life, you're not going to use difficult circumstances as an excuse for not to give. And perhaps this is why a lot of poor people generally seem to have a greater ability to identify with those in need and are more uh, tend to release uh, their finances more easily. And you'll find this, especially when you go into third world countries. There are some of the poorest people, but there are some of the most generous people. They give, you know, the shirt off their back for you. And here's a couple statistics just to keep in mind. Um, statistically, just to bear the fact that the poor segment and any congregations actually supports the ministry. Less than 5% of a congregation actually tithe. Now, tithe is the 10%, not just, I'm just giving. Well over 80 to 90% are given only 2% of their income. Also on a report that talks about the, the generous givers are better off financially than their non-tithers or givers uh, counterparts. So you'll, you'll see that uh, component. Those who hold it to themselves, they're, 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 you know, it's, it's a different um, generosity. They, they might do it in other ways, but you can see there's a, a component, a spiritual aspect to, to giving. The data also shows that tithers are distributed almost equally across all income brackets, not just those with extra income. So it doesn't matter if you're dirt poor or you're super rich, you know, um, you know it's, it's the, 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 the data shows that it's equally across and, and who's giving uh, the, the proportion. Tithers also uh, carry outsized uh, importance in the congregation. If people don't give, the church is going to be hard to continue on. Uh, so regardless of the amount, um, if people are not giving to uh, that work. The study also found uh, comprised that only 10 to 25 percent of uh, members in the church give. Uh, they, they, they're actually providing more than 80 uh, percent of the funding. And there's many other statistics uh, that you can go into, but it can get depressing, uh, embarrassing, and probably uh, ashamed uh, when we get into uh, you know, the Christian churches and, 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 and the giving uh, that, you know, even I know this statistic in America, I don't know it here, but people spend more on pet food than giving to the ministry or to mission work. That's sad, but that, that's a reality of what's happening. Uh, and there are some who don't even believe in giving or tithing. Um, uh, they don't have an answer. Uh, how are you going to pay for the rent here? How are you going to pay for the insurance and all the other uh, things it takes a church to operate? Uh, I guess money just grows on trees and just shows up in your account miraculously. Uh, but they like to benefit from those who do give to whatever ministry or whatever work or church uh, is their mentality. Anyways, the, the church in Philippi, as Paul says, although they were in great affliction, they shared out of their poverty. The result, again, when you read through the uh, book of Philippians, it's the most joyous letter. Yet Paul was in prison, he, and he saw the giving of what was happening there. And, uh, uh, and that's the key, is having that generous heart. Giving is a privilege and a joy, uh, and the fact that's proven cons uh, con um, consistently uh, through these churches that Paul's mentioning uh, by the Philippians. Uh, Paul didn't ask them to give, they asked Paul to give. They, notice that urgency. Hey, Lord, you know, Paul, take this gift. There's an urgency that they wanted to do instead of Paul asking them. Uh, they implored him with much urgency, as our text says, to receive their gift. Uh, the second characteristics of a person motivated by God's grace is that when they give, they're enthusiastic 
about it, cheerful about it, um, uh, freely willing to give. Uh, and, and notice that they implored, they begged Paul to receive their gift. So the believers in Macedonia simply wouldn't want to be left out of their, uh, this opportunity for this relief effort, uh, found that they could help in any way they could. And so they had this enthusiasm. Are we enthusiastic when we give to the Lord? Uh, and we can check by our attitude and how we're giving. Um, and, and a little bit later in chapter 9, we'll see uh, next week that he gives uh, in, purposely in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, God loves a cheerful giver. So if you give with a cheerful heart, then you're an enthusiastic giver. Someone who understands the grace that you've been receiving. So, and it's that joy in your heart. It's, you know, you're, you're just praising the Lord through it all. Instead of you're laughing because of the, the, the minimal amount, <laughs> you know. But, um, but you're just having that overjoy of love for the Lord. However the Lord wants to meet the need. Whatever amount he's put on your heart, he, he, you know, you're, you're here to honor him in that. On the other hand, if you're simply going through the motions and complaining about it, fine, I'll give him this. And you write your check so meanly, you know. Keep it. God doesn't need your money. You know, it's the attitude that we have behind it. It's the generous heart versus the, the angry uh, heart. Um, and, and so the Lord provides us the opportunity to give to his work, uh, and it protects our heart from pride. It protects our heart from idolatry and possessions. Uh, it's for our benefit in the end as well. And so that giving that we might share in the fruit of the work that's done, because when you're giving, you're investing in the kingdom of God, and that will come back to your account on judgment day. Oh, for that reason, I'm just going to give, <laughs> you know, but it comes down to your heart's attitude and the proper motivations in doing it. And so they needed to learn to trust God for their every need. One of the things that uh, I'll bring it up now. I was uh, sharing at a church in Southern California, one of our homelies in the early days, and uh, they had two services. Uh, the offering plate went by, and I had 15 bucks in my, my wallet. And so I, I, I gave $5 on the first service. And I was hoping I was using the, the $10 to put some gas in the car and, and get home. Second service comes by, the Lord prompts on my heart, you know, to, to give that $10. Oh, come on, Lord. But, you know, I'll, I'll trust you. I put it in. After the service, this couple came up to me after I uh, was sharing. I said, the Lord put on our hearts to give you this. And it was a hundred bucks. But if I didn't put in what I, God put on my heart to do, you know, even though I was kind of, uh, all right, I'll just trust you. Then that wouldn't have happened. So, so it's just that simple account. He will take care of you when you do what he tells you to do. Just be obedient to it. He, he will take care of you, you know. And it was said for the Macedonian Christians, giving is not a chore, but a challenge, uh, not a burden, but a blessing. Giving is not something to be avoided, but a privilege to be desired. That's the right attitude that we need to have. That's the example of the Macedonians. They gave proportionately, notice that verse 3, to their ability, sacrificially, beyond their ability, verse 3, uh, also willingly. There's no pressure. Please, there's no pressure. If, if you feel pressure to give, then don't give. You know, it's between you and the Lord. And they gave enthusiastically, as we see in verse 4. And as you notice what the Macedonians are saying, please take an offering. Now, Paul uses three Greek words to describe Christian generosity. The first is that of privilege. Uh, it's the word that uh, he uses, charis, here, commonly translated as grace. Uh, it's the opportunity to give out of one's wealth as an entirely uh, gift from God. Secondly, that of sharing. It's the word for koinonia, where we get the word fellowship from. And so just as the Corinthians were sharing in Paul's ministry by praying for him, uh, the Macedonians knew that by giving, they were sharing their great joy of their salvation with other believers. And so in essence, this fellowship, this uh, Christian sharing with each other, their enthusiasm for the Lord. And then finally, he describes it as service. Uh, it's the word diakonos, uh, where, it's where we drive the word deacon from. So giving money is a way to serve others. Um, that's how that is uh, uh, connected there. So one should not give because uh, they're well off, but they give because they have a willing heart. The Macedonians saw giving as a privilege, not as a problem. You see, giving, grace giving uh, of one's life is an act of worship. Uh, before you give your money. 
So it's your life you're going to get first and foremost. And then there's other things that he, 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 um, you give back to the Lord. Verse 5 goes on to say, not only that we have hope, but first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So it starts there. When you give uh, yourself totally over to the Lord, you're, you're, you're offering your time, your talent, your treasures, the whole you know, nine yards, the whole enchilada, if you will. It's, it's all yours, Lord. My time is yours. My talents are yours. My treasure is yours. And the Macedonians giving was not motivated by desire for praise from Paul or from others. It was from the Lord. Their generosity was fundamental, uh, motivated by their desire to serve the Lord. That's how it is when we give. It's for you, Lord. Their generosity, their charity wasn't for their own sake. It wasn't for looking for congratulations or looking how we do this. And sometimes if you're to watch some YouTube clips and, and uh, there's this uh, lively Pentecostal church uh, that I've seen people dancing through the aisles and doing backflips and they're giving, you know, and just watching this attention, you know, just uh, it's just crazy. Um, but they weren't doing uh, giving to make them feel good. They gig because it's the Lord's. Everything that they had, even their souls, was the Lord. They knew this. They devoted themselves to serving Jesus uh, and, and, and the kingdom of God this way. And may that be said of us. If you have an open heart, you'll have an open hand. Uh, and here's the thing. If you, have, um, and, and the, if you have a problem with giving, with kind of this tight fist, your problem's much deeper than your wallet. And, and the Lord needs to get a hold of that. And it's about surrendering to the Lord. Uh, what impressed Paul was not how much they gave, but their, how willing uh, they were to give themselves and their possessions to the Lord. Uh, those who surrender their lives to the Lord are in a position to give beyond their ability. Uh, believers' wealth and possessions are not theirs to keep. It's the Lord's. You're entrusted to it. You are a steward. You are a manager. Uh, they are to manage on, on behalf of the true owner. That's what the word stewardship is. And, uh, and I encourage you, take some time. Um, and prayer uh, over your, your priorities, your time, your treasures, whatever. And just what is the Lord telling you about it? What does he want you to do with it? Verse 6 goes on to say, so then we urge Titus that he begun, so he also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence, uh, you have love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Now, these verses that we see Paul asking the church in Corinth to follow through with the same type of generosity that was shown to the church in Macedonia. In other words, Paul was saying, was, was given the church in Corinth a reputation to live up to. Uh, and the key verse that we see here is that the point of these uh, two chapters. One reason was that he was sending Titus uh, and others, as we'll see in a moment, uh, to Corinth, not only to deliver this letter to the Corinthians, but also to get the uh, to, to follow through with the financial contribution that they've made and promised to help the church out in Jerusalem. So Paul wanted the, the church in Corinth to grow in their generosity. Uh, Paul wants the, the Corinthians, uh, and, and everywhere for that matter, to trust in God and their ability to give to others. And, and to put a, a principle this way, one of the most difficult things to do is just to follow through with one's promises. You know, and, that, and that's really the, the key to and the secret to success in life is to, you follow through with what your plans are instead of quit. Um, most people have wonderful plans, great ideas, uh, but out of fear, they often don't follow through with those plans. In other words, we fear failure. And out of that failure, we don't follow through in some of the things in life that we uh, want to do or things that God wants us to do. Uh, the, the fears are rooted in, in that lack of trust in the Lord uh, to see our way through such times like this, uh, financially in this circumstance. And all this does tie to what Paul is saying here, to overcome our fears. Uh, the point is um, at hand at what Paul wanted the church in Corinth to follow through with their giving. You know, you promised you know, a year ago that you would, you would contribute to this need uh, in Jerusalem. Now let's, let's follow through with that. And what Paul wanted uh, was to see that the church learned to trust the Lord. Uh, and that meant to trust him financially as well as to trust them in their salvation and their survival. And, and that's where it all starts. It's just trust in the Lord. He, he will take care of it. Many Christians often convince themselves 
that even though they don't give to the church, they, they give by serving. And they think that that's a substitute. But Paul is being very tactful here. And he points out that serving the Lord is no substitute for giving. And there's where a lot of people say, oh, I don't have to give because I'm serving. And that's not what is the idea here. After all, if you serve the Lord, it's because he's given you the gift and, and empower you to, uh, to serve. But giving is something different. Uh, giving is different than serving. And so it's, it's doing both is the idea here. Now, since the Corinthians were so outstanding in many ways, um, Paul now wants them to excel in the matter of giving. And he gives them credit for abounding in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in diligence, in, in their love for him. And so Paul would like to add the other expression, in all generosity, once you excel in this as well. And so Paul encouraged the Corinthians to excel in grace giving. And too often, stewardship of money is given a different status than other aspects of discipleship. Um, many believers don't want to stop their growth in knowledge and, and love, you know, or that to just hit a certain level. Yet many, when it comes to giving, there's a fixed percentage. Um, it, you know, it stays there for their life. They don't go beyond that. Um, but yet true discipleship includes growing in maturity in all resources. So, so giving should expand as well. As you're growing and maturing in the Lord, so would your giving and your opportunity there. And God can give you the desire and ability uh, for you to increase your capacity to give. And, and if I can encourage you, don't miss those opportunities for growth. What, what's the Lord challenge you on? Take that step of faith. Uh, for me, when I first started out, um, you know, it wasn't 10%. It was just minimal percent. And then as things uh, grew, then I was able to increase uh, what I was able to give to the Lord. As I learned to budget my money and give him the first fruits. Um, we also see that giving is motivated by grace, as we see in verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but I'm also testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. So notice he didn't command them, you got to do this uh, in regards to giving. He didn't, he, he didn't even remind them about the tithe. Giving is in proportion to the sincerity of your love. It, is your love for the Lord limited? then neither should be your giving be limited when it comes down to uh, this context here. God, is, if, if he's put that, you know, on your heart to tithe, um, that 10%, then do so. You know, whatever he's put on your heart is the key. Let me tell you an embarrassing story. As I uh, probably mentioned before, uh, when I first started out in the ministry, my home church, um, I was pretty sporadic in my giving, you know, just kind of impulsive. Uh, which is the way most Christians are when it comes to giving, which is another step we'll learn next week. Um, I wrote a check out for $50. For me, that was a lot because my salary was 900 a month. Uh, and I was working full time, another job, $8 an hour. So didn't have a whole lot, but $50 was a lot. Um, but I knew just to trust the Lord. Well, Tuesday morning, the accountant comes into the office and uh, tells me that my check has bounced. That's embarrassing when you're serving on staff at a church and uh, I thought I had enough money in my account, $50, and I obviously didn't because my check had bounced. Uh, but from that time on and that embarrassment, I learned to budget, you know, and, and work through my finances and giving the Lord the first fruits, not my leftovers. Uh, and that was my leftovers, what I thought I had. And so that was a lesson learned there. But be set free. Uh, to give more as you see the grace of God work in our Give what he's put on your heart to do. Give generously. Give faithfully. Whatever it is. You know, uh, be strategic about how you do it as well. I love to give back to the Lord because how the Lord's blessed me. And the more I give to the Lord, the more he blesses me. Uh, and it's just being that good steward of, of that. And so it's just kind of being faithful with that um, and, and being realistic with some of those things. And, and again, build it with time, you know, and, and eventually you, you, your goal would be higher percentage wise. But it's because of the Lord, uh, not because of, you know, uh, you know, for any other reason. Now, verse nine, we see an example of grace giving that's dependent upon the example of Jesus Christ. Notice it says, for, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich for it, your sakes, uh, he became poor, that through his poverty, you might become rich. 
This is one of the most powerful verses in the chapter. Jesus is always the perfect example for us to follow. In service, in suffering, and in sacrifice. If we do what Jesus did, then we'll find ourselves right in the middle of God's will. And that includes in our giving. Well, Paul points out also in verse 5, as we mentioned, that the Macedonians followed Jesus' example. They gave themselves to the Lord. Uh, and then to us by the will of God. So they demonstrated the reality of their faith, and they understood that gra- the grace by giving themselves and the resources to serve the Lord and to serve uh, the, the others that way. So they were moved to, um, you know, to, to give everything for the Lord because Jesus gave everything for us. Um, the only response is to, to give themselves for him. The least that we can do is to serve the Lord. We, we give him everything. It's his. And so Paul challenges his friends in Corinth to prove the reality of their love for the Lord and his people by following Jesus' example, giving the resources and of themselves just as Jesus gave himself for us. And uh, one of the things I love about Jesus is that he never asked me to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. He set the example for us. And, and so it is in regards to, to serving and he gave because he loves us. That, that's, you know, he demonstrated his love toward us. Uh, and again, we're reminded it's about that love factor. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 3, as Paul says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So if we're really to follow Jesus' example, we give with the motivation of love. Love for God. And love for others. The great commandment, right? That's how it is. Verse uh, 10 goes on to say, and this is the other component of giving, grace giving. It requires faith. And this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to do what you began, but you're designed to do a year ago. But now you also must complete the doing of it. There is a readiness to desire it. And so you may have completion out of what you have. Now, Paul's careful not to command the Corinthians. He's only giving them advice. Here's a piece of advice. It's not, thus saith the Lord, but here's a a word of advice for you. Kind of like a coach in a locker room at halftime. He's calling the Corinthians to to finish what they have begun. Let's go out in the second half and let's, you know, do what we needed to do, you know, as, as we did in the first half. They had distinguished themselves as winners thus far, but the game isn't over yet. Let's finish this race. Let's finish this game strong. And so the excitement of starting must be matched by the determination of completion. Let's finish even stronger than how we started. And so Paul would say to them, you've expressed a desire to to give, now do it. And here lies really the danger for us and, and the hazards of um, Bible study is thinking that just by writing something down in our notes or agreeing it within our hearts is actually doing whatever it is that we're writing down or agreeing with. But it's not. It's doing it is what makes the difference. Just like James says, uh, the one who looks in the mirror and realizes that there should be some changes but doesn't do anything about it, right? So you can agree to it, but what are you going to do about it? Be doers of the word, not just hearers only. And, and Jesus says, you know, happy are you if you do these things uh, from the other commands in John 13. So the key is just to start somewhere. Just, just do something, you know, and the blessing is not in agreeing, it's in doing. Amen? Verse 12, for there were first a willing mind and it accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burden, but an equality that now the time of your abundance may supply to their lack and their abundance also may supply your lack that there may be equality. It is written, he who gathered much has nothing left over and he who gathered little had no lack. Now, these are some weighty thoughts on God's providence in these verses. Uh, God sees, too, that some believers, they have a lot uh, and, and some have little. Uh, and those who have more will share with those who have less. Pretty simple. Uh, those who have more thereby express the grace of God in a practical way. Those who have less ex- experience God in other practical ways. So giving is always an act of faith. 
you're trusting the Lord uh, for those needs. No matter how much money you have or how rich or how poor, the act of giving always involves faith. Faith, as we're obedient to the Lord, he can be trusted to meet our every need. And that's why Paul is pointing to the experience of the Corinthians back to the Jewish people in Exodus 15 as they're going through. And this is the illustration here and the quote that is mentioned here. And the point is that God's provision of the manna uh, for the people in the desert didn't matter uh, where they, uh, you know, gathered a lot or little. There's always the right amount for them. Uh, for the family, to, to feed them. Nothing left over, and no one was left hungry. They had the right amount each and every day. It was a lesson of faith to the Jewish people. And so they learned to trust God for their daily provision. Uh, if they grabbed too much, it would turn to waste, right? So it was whatever the amount is that you need for the day. So God can be trusted to satisfy their hunger today and tomorrow. If they simply trust him to provide rather than trying to hoard God's blessings. And remember, those who tried to hoard it, they found it, it didn't last the next day. The principle then, as it applies to our giving, is that we're called to give um, and to, 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 you know, whatever he's provided for us. To give back to him as he directs. Uh, and it's faith in trusting that he will provide for our needs. So in the principles of the tithing, you give 10% and you're going to trust him to provide your 90%. You're living on that. And he will take care of those needs. That's the trust factor. And I think it's safe to say that giving is one of the most difficult tests of faith for God's people. We seem to like to trust God with about everything except our bank account, right? We will trust him for this, but not my bank account. Um. And so it was, if you remember, in the days of Malachi, the prophet. We find that God's people were uh, holding on tightly uh, to what uh, they, little they had, rather than uh, supporting the work of God in the temple. And in spite of God's goodness uh, to deliver them from the captivity of Babylon, restoring them to the promised land and uh, rebuilding the temple, uh, people still lacked the, the faith uh, to support the work in the temple. Uh, because life was still hard. Um, the crops were still sparse. Um, they didn't trust God to provide for tomorrow's needs. You know, so they're struggling there. And so God sent the prophet Malachi with the challenge to, to test uh, and to see whether or not he was able to provide for the needs. And he says in Malachi 3.10, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me in this, test me in this, says the Lord. If or not, I'll open the windows of heaven. And pour out such a blessing, there will be no room enough to receive it. So what the Lord was doing is he was reminding them of their failure to bring the tithes and the offerings. Um, and, uh, and, the, and thus they were robbing God in this and, and bringing a curse upon themselves. If they were faithful and they give of their tithes, the Lord will bless them with incredible plenty. Uh, so much so there's not enough room to do it. But he says, test me in this. And, and this is where we tell people, trust the Lord in this. Give him this. Be consistent with it. And watch how the Lord's going to bless you in this. And uh, he will deliver them through the drought, the plague, the enemies. Um, and, and there's so much that they weren't able to use it all. Everyone wants that. But it starts with giving to the Lord consistently. Not just once off. He may still bless you that once off, but it's the, the faithfulness, the consistency is where you're going to see that track pattern in your life. Now, as we move into the last main point of this chapter, keep in mind about being faithful, consistent, but it's also about faithful in character, uh, being faithful people. Uh, as it says in verse 16, but thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the hearts of Titus and the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but more being more diligent, he wants you uh, of his own accord. So the first qualification called to handle the gifts uh, of the saints is that they must have a servant's heart. Um, whatever needs to be done, you do it. You, you see a need, you meet a need. Uh, you, you fill the gaps. You know, you have that ser servant's heart, that sensitivity there. And that's one of the first things in the requirements that we see here. And keep in mind, you are serving the Lord. Uh, it's no coincidence that Paul tells us in verse 17 that Titus was what? 
What does it say there? Diligent in his desire to serve uh, the Corinthians in this kind of simple, mundane, uh, but yet important task. It's going to change lives just by the simple task. So never underestimate what you do for the Lord. Uh, it, you know, the Lord sees it and, and he'll honor that. Verse 18, for we have sent him the brother who prays uh, is in the gospel throughout all the churches. So in addition to Titus, Paul sends another brother to help them with the collection there in Corinth. We're not told who this brother's name is, uh, but rather it doesn't seem like it's required to have any introduction because the people in Corinth probably already knew this brother. Um, and he was known for their burden for the lost. He was kind of an evangelist for them. You know, he was always praying for the lost and praying for, um, you know, souls. Um, and, and, and it's easy, like we said, for the, for the local church or ministry to become so focused on one's uh, own needs uh, and, and plans that they forget that we're, we're also called to reach the lost. You know, and we should have a sign outside the, the gate here. You're reaching the mission field. You're now entering the mission field that you're all called to go out there and, and reach as many people as possible. And, 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 and so within the context here, there, there's this right balance that we need with the financial wisdom and the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, we need to have these um, take God directed risks when the numbers don't add up. Uh, when we didn't have the, the finances to, to make that commitment to, to buy the chairs here, but we knew God called us to come here, you know, he, he's going to provide. Um, and and, and you've got to be willing to take a step of faith and trust the Lord uh, in, in some ways. Sometimes it's little matters, sometimes it's bigger matters. Uh, you know, and you've heard the statement where God guides, he provides. God's work done God's way is not going to lack his support. You know, so if the Lord wants it to happen, he'll make it happen. You know, and there's times like we sometimes do a disservice by not mentioning some of the financial needs. We're just going to trust the Lord to provide. But there's times that we need to let a need known to you. So how, how can we help you with that? You know, and uh, so so when those times do come, we do as much as we can mention to you. Um, but that is how God provides as well. But we don't, you know, beg or, um, you know, manipulate people or coerce people into giving. It's like, you know, you, you do what God's put on your heart to do. It's the Lord's church. It's not my church. You know, he'll take care of it. Verse 19 and not only that, but also who's chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which administered by us to the glory of God himself and to show your ready mind. So any gift, by the way, given to the Lord's work, uh, any person handling the gift should be motivated by a desire to honor God. Uh, they're accountable to the Lord on Judgment Day for how they're handling it as well. And so this collection taken up by these churches um, is not done uh, with any purpose to bring glory to themselves or anything else, but it's to bring honor and glory to the Lord. Avoiding this, verse 20, that anyone should be blamed in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men, that we have sent with them our brother, who have often proved diligent in many things, but how much more diligent because of the great confidence that we have in you. So it's important that the, the, the people involved in the administration of the finances of the money given to God's work have good reputation, men of God that are honorable, above reproach, um, people of integrity, um, so that the work of God can't be slandered, uh, nor the testimony of the church be tarnished. Uh, they're not going to rip the church off. And so Paul writes there to make sure that we handle and God money in a, in a in a proper way, honest way, um, that's being used properly. And so Paul reminds us that uh, the, the practical administration of the funds given to the ministry as to maintain good reputation with men of God, and also reputation with men as well. Um, Verse 23 goes on to say, if anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you, or our brethren inquired about their messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show them and before the churches the proof of your love and our boasting on your behalf. So a key qualification, as we mentioned, uh, for those who are handling the, the finances, um, they, they got to have proven character, uh, mature, godly men. Um, they are team players as well. We all have a role. We all have a, a part on the team. 
Um, and giving, you're part of the team. Showing up, you're part of the team. We all have this opportunity uh, to, to make a difference for the Lord. Team players understand that God is the one that assigns the task. He is the one that determines the scope of the ministry. He is the one that gives the gifts that he wants us to have. He is the one who wants uh, to make you fruitful and and for you to be fruitful. Uh, He's the one that opens doors or closes doors. Uh, And by God's grace, we have our ministry. And what matters to God is our faithfulness. We want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? That is something that no matter what our task is, whatever our role is, we want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, And it's not just uh, serving, but it's also giving. You're being faithful in those aspects as well, because that makes a difference. That allows the the church to continue or ministry to continue. Or when we send uh, money to uh, the missionaries overseas, you're contributing to that work over there and it's going to your account. So. These will enable you to, to understand that, you know, as God has commissioned you, you're, you're a part of the team. Um, and, and notice that Paul calls Titus his partner and fellow worker. So, so the point is that the ministry in general, it's critical that everyone be on the same page and shares the same vision. And every church has a different vision. You know, for ours, it's just connecting people to Jesus. And we do that simply by teaching the Bible uh, and all the other aspects that we do here. It's, it's not complicated, but that's what it's about. It's about Jesus. Not about the pastor, not about uh, the church. It's about Jesus. Um, but if you don't have that common vision, um, th- then you're going to be constantly striving uh, for another as you seek to accomplish different visions um, out there. And in the example before us here, the vision was to provide relief for the church in Jerusalem. So all these churches were on the same page. All the workers were on the same page to do that. Paul, Titus, the ministry team helped Paul with the same mind. But what if uh, Titus wanted to do his own thing? And he took the finances. I'm going to start my own church and um, you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. You know, and he takes this, you know, they wouldn't be of the same mind, same vision. It wouldn't be of the Lord. The, the, the work of the Lord would be hindered. So a key question to, to ask ourselves is uh, what's the, the Holy Spirit leading us to do, you know, in this time, in this season, in this church? Uh, every church, every ministry is faced with the same limitations. And we'd love to uh, be able to be involved in uh, supporting all kinds of work um, Everywhere around the world. If I was a billionaire, how many missionaries can I support or churches I can plant? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that resource. But what, what, what can we do right now with what we have at our hands, um, you know, the resources to, to do so? And so each person, each church, each ministry must seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, to know what specific task the Lord has called them to. And that calling is going to be tested as well. Um, you know, kind of sifting it, you know, to get your roots firmly established as well. But it all starts with uh, having this understanding when it comes to giving and and, and tithing and however else, whatever terms you want to use, giving to the Lord. It starts with you surrendering your life to him. It starts with being motivated by the grace of God. Uh, It requires faith and faithfulness. So these are all just aspects in our life that uh, we can easily implement. So grace giving enriches you as you enrich others and makes you more like Jesus. And my hope and my prayer is that we'd all discover the thrill of grace giving. You know, that you're a generous person uh, with your time, with your talent, with your treasures. To to be surrendered to the Lord, to be a good steward of what he's given you, what he's blessed you with. And keep in mind, as we said earlier, when you give, you're investing in the kingdom of God. Uh, It goes to your account. You're making a difference, an eternal difference uh, that impacts others. Um, And and, uh, you'll be rewarded for your contribution. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your provision for our lives. Uh, When we go through difficult times, how you are faithful. Uh, Sometimes you even put on people's hearts to to come alongside us, to support us. Uh, Thank you for your faithfulness in taking care of us as a church as well. When we've had very little, how you've always sustained us and how you've blessed us now. Uh, with abundance, and how we can use that to to reach more people. So we thank you for your grace and mercy. I pray that you bless each and every one here in a mighty special way, that they'd be sensitive to what you're telling them to do, and that they would be obedient, not 
uh, just hearers only, but they would be doers as well. And that in terms of their time, uh, their talent, and their treasure. So we thank you uh, for these words of exhortation in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.